Good evening, everybody. Welcome back to the Mythgard Academy, session number 31 of our Lamort d'Arthur class. Now we are getting close to the end now. Tonight we begin that final home stretch that I've been telling you about when uh, uh, Maori storytelling really reaches its highest form and we get the big climactic events of the lives of Lancelot and Guinevere. Oh, and also Arthur. Yeah, uh, we got to... Uh, see him briefly uh, in today's reading, which was really kind of fun. Anyway, so uh, we'll jump right into that in a second. One quick, uh, one just a couple quick announcements. Um, we had our uh, Sunshine Moot this past week, our first uh, uh, Signum Moot down in Florida, which was great. Really had a wonderful time meeting all of the uh, uh, folks down there. Our next Moot, our next regional Moot, another uh, new one, um, is Nader Moot out in uh, the Netherlands, uh, in Leiden, uh, next month on the 13th of April. Uh, so those of you who are over in Europe would really hope to uh, get to see some of you. It's our second, my second trip over to Europe, our second moot over there. We had London moot last year and uh, uh, Nader moot this year. Um, so that's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, the other thing to uh, mention to folks is that we have... Um, uh, our summer courses uh, coming soon. Our summer registration is open now. Uh, it's about a month, a little more than a month before the summer classes begin. Uh, so I encourage you to look into that, especially, of course, we have a, uh, a, a brand new course that we're offering this summer on the Inklings and King Arthur, um, looking at all of the, because King Arthur was a, a very great interest to all of the Inklings. It was a sort of a common theme uh, among them was their, uh, their, their interest in various ways about King Arthur. Um, so you'll be able to find out some more about that and see uh, what resonance all of this Arthurian stuff had for, uh, for your favorite Inklings and possibly some Inklings that you don't know about uh, or don't know that much about. If you've never read much Charles Williams, for instance, he, uh, I don't want to say is obsessed with the Holy Grail, but he is very interested in the Holy Grail, uh, very central to his thinking. So uh, uh, certainly um, uh, this is something you will learn more about. Anyway, uh, so that's going to be a really fun uh, course. And of course, uh, uh, other classes we're offering as well this summer. You can find out more about those on SignumUniversity.org. Um, and uh, the last thing I wanted to mention is we have um, uh, uh, we have be uh, I, so I did my State of the Union uh, State of the Union it's not a union State of the University address on Monday night uh, in which I kind of gave a, a big update about where we are and what's been going on and where we're headed here at Signum and what's coming up. Um, the recording of that will be posted soon, so I just wanted to let you uh, to sort of for those of you who missed it uh, to kind of keep an eye out for that. So all right. Um, let us, uh, oh, and of course, Mythmoot. Mythmoot is coming up uh, at the end of June. Want to make sure to draw your attention to that. Um, what a wonderful time. Mythmoot is going to be really excited about that. So um, uh, uh, look for more uh, uh, announcements and things on Mythmoot uh, to come soon. So um, June 27th through the 30th are the dates uh, for Mythmoot. Hope you can join us there. All right. Um, let us get right in. We've got a bunch of Maori to talk about tonight. I've called this class Privy Thoughts and Outward Seeming, as uh, this is, of course, one of the major issues, right? One of the major themes uh, of tonight's uh, discussion. And I will confess right off, I've spent a lot... Of, we are entering the uh, part of this book that I know best. Um, I've actually published on these last two books uh, an article uh, uh, on uh, uh, Maori's depiction of Lancelot and Guinevere here at the end. And um, I... Uh, so I know... I, I, I guess I'm fairly familiar with the text in through here, and I will confess with embarrassment that I... <laughs> there was... Something I'd never really noticed before, and it seems so obvious in retrospect, but again, that's why I named uh, my titled the class this. Of course, you will remember that there were several references uh, during the Lancelot sections of the Holy Grail quest that there is potentially a difference between his outward seeming and his privy thoughts, right? His confession was sincere, but it was predicted that he would be unstable. 
right, that he would backslide, um, that although his outward seeming was towards God, his privy thoughts were still focused on Guinevere. Um, but of course, the thing that I never noticed before was the way that this maps directly and immediately onto the story of Lancelot and Guinevere themselves, um, that while the sort of larger spiritual question, right, is this business about his privy, Lancelot's privy thoughts and his outward seeming, um, at the same time, on other, in other ways and in different dimensions, this same thing is the predominant theme, right? Like, whether it's towards God and towards Guinevere, or whether it's towards Guinevere or towards other women, right? There's all of this, like, Lancelot changing his outward seeming, right? Like, going out of his way to help more and more maidens all the time, right? So that it will distract away from where his privy thoughts are, um, so that people won't suspect where his privy thoughts are. Um, that, uh, so the, the, the way in which this whole section, uh, is kind of examining this whole issue from several different directions, right? And one of the things, of course, that keeps needing to happen, right, is, is, is Guinevere, you know, going to be willing, basically, to look past the outward seeming to his privy thoughts. And then on the other hand, is somebody like Sir Agravain going to be able to see past the outward seeming and to his privy thoughts, right? And the way that those two different conflicts uh, parallel, interestingly, you know, God's penetrating his outward seeming and seeing his privy thoughts is really interesting, I think, and sets this stuff up uh, in a really, really cool way. Um, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, and I, I, Carrie, I agree. Privy is kind of a strange word uh, uh, f to modern ears, perhaps. Um, uh, a word that uh, Mallory uses several times, uh, clearly is just simply meaning inner or private. Um, the thoughts that are going on within his heart, right? Uh, rather than the things that he is showing on the outside. Um, okay, well, let's get into the story here. And... I'm going to take the risk of going backwards just a tiny bit. This is the very end of the Grail story. When Galahad and Percival have both died and Sir Bors has buried both of them, right, in the in the city of Saras, and then he comes home, right, and is welcomed back at the, at the court of King Arthur and he and Lancelot meet up again. So this is uh, um, Bors and Lancelot there at the very, very end. And anon Sir Bors sighed to Sir Launcelot, Sir Galahad, your own son, saluted you by me, and after you, my lord King Arthur, and all the whole court, and so did Sir Percival. For I buried them, both mine own hondas in the city of Saras. Also, Sir Launcelot, Sir Galahad pride you to remember of this unsicker world, as ye behicked him when ye were togetters more than half a year. This is true, sighed Sir Launcelot. Now I trust to God, his prior shall avile me. Thou Sir Launcelot took Sir Bors in his arms and sighed, Cousin, ye are raked welcome to me. For all that ever I may do for you and for yours, ye shall find my poor body ready at, ready at a times while the spirit is in it, and that I promise you faithfully and never to file. And wet ye well, gentle cousin Sir Bors, ye and I shall never depart in sunder, while as our lives may last. Sir, sighed he, as ye wall, so wall I. All right. Um, so two primary things. One thing about the first half, one thing about the second half here of this passage. The reminder, right? And look at the wording of Galahad's final remembrance, right? His final reminder uh, to Lancelot, remember of this unsicker world, right? Unsicker, which means uncertain, unstable. Um, really, more literally, um, more literally uncertain. Um, you can't count on it, right? You can't count on the things of this world. I was, when I was talking about 
Galahad's injunction to Lancelot last time, I made allusion to the biblical parable um, at the very end of the, of the Sermon on the Mount about the man who built his house upon the sand versus the man who built his house upon the rock, right? Um, that is the kind of thing that Galahad is referring to here, right? The thing about the world is not that the world is evil, right? It's not that the world is, like, everything in the world is evil, right? And the things of the world are bad and the things of the spirit are good. It's not quite as dualistic as that. Um, but the one thing that is true about even the best things in the world is that they're unsicker. They're uncertain. You can't count on them. They'll fail you right? Even the best things in your life can fail you, right? Can let you down, will not always be there. Um, and that's not to say that like all friends will betray you, but at the very least, they're eventually going to die, right? I mean, that's, that's what it means, right? The world is unsicker. It can't be counted on. Um, and that's the final message that Galahad has for Lancelot. Um, and again, Keep this in mind. Guinevere is not going to come off looking very good in this section, I know. Um, and Mallory's Guinevere, I don't think, is anybody's favorite Guinevere. Um, but the one thing I would say to that... I'm not trying to like anyone who wants to make an argument that Maori's Guinevere uh, is sort of a like misogynistic Guinevere. That is to say, sort of like suggesting uh, some kind of anti-feminist perspectives on Maori's part. I think that's a makeable argument, um, and I wouldn't necessarily fight it. Um, but what I would add to it, I mean, if uh, if you don't like Guinevere and um, you think that you know she who is supposed to be really kind of at the pinnacle, right? She was the, the head of the, le of the, of the female leaderboard, right? Um, uh, if she is depicted as unflatteringly as she is, what does that suggest about what Mallory is saying about women in general, right? Again, I, I totally can, you know, see that line of reasoning here as you're reading uh, this part of the story. The thing that I would... Again, not say to try to alter that, but to add to that as sort of a, as a as a second layer on top of that. Um, Guinevere is, in part, in an unenviable uh, situation. Right? Um, I think that the the question of Lancelot and Guinevere's relationship, like where the two of them will end up in their relationship, what she's going to do right, in her relationship towards him, is kind of the secondary story. This is the primary story. Lancelot, remember of this unsicker world. It is sort of the spiritual drama of Lancelot that we are given as sort of the framing mechanism here uh, at the beginning of this, and spoiler, we'll get it again at the end, right? Um, and Guinevere is in a lot of ways... I don't want to say the symbol because I don't want to make her into an allegory or only or sort of reduce her merely into an allegory. That wouldn't be fair at all to the story. Um, but she is very clearly connected with that. Um, she is. Uh, um, so when she is acting. There are times you will see Guinevere be, well, unsicker, right? She's going to be unstable. Lancelot can't count on her, right? And that, I don't think, is a mistake, nor just a ref nor merely a reflection of Maori depicting an unflattering, you know, Guinevere because he hates women or something like that. Again, not saying it's not a factor, uh, not saying that he doesn't have to deal with the choices that he's made, but nevertheless, it's not the only point, I think. And I think if we only see that, we're missing the larger point. And Lancelot, whether you like it or not, whether it's fair, whether you think it's fair or not, whether it's the way you would have done it or not, Lancelot is the center of this story, not Guinevere. But having said that, Guinevere is going to get her own ending to the story. And I think that where Guinevere ends up is kind of interesting, 
actually. Um, uh, no, I'm going to go a little bit further than that. I'm going to say I think that Mallory, in my opinion, kind of redeems Guinevere by the end. Um, I think he, at least in my opinion, comes a, at least a little bit of a ways to kind of make up for the way that he sort of depicts her in these last two sections, especially. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, oh, gosh. Karita's asking me which one is my favorite. My favorite Guinevere. G goodness. I'm not sure off the top of my head. There are a lot of unflatterable Guinevere's. You know, the Guinevere in, like, ironically, Karita, one of the Guinevere's I kind of like is the Guinevere, uh, the one Guinevere who, like, most thoroughly betrays Arthur. That is the Guinevere of the alliterative Mort Arthur, who has a, a like, fully mutual um, uh, uh, affair with Mordred after Arthur leaves the country and bears him children, right? And the reason I, I like her, I kind of like her, is that she's, she, like... <laughs> She betrays Arthur, but then she sticks to it, doggone it. You know, I mean, like, she goes and she flees with her children, and she's, like, you know, she's, um, uh, she's there. Um, she's not just, like, a pawn sort of bandied back and forth. Um, yeah, I don't know. That is a little weird, maybe, Nancy. But again, the thing that, I, I think, Nancy, what I'm trying to articulate here is one of the things that I dislike most about a lot of depictions of Guinevere is exactly that. Her just being a kind of uh, placeholder, right? And not, like, doing anything of her own. Not uh, uh, not actually kind of taking a stand for anything. Um, uh, so, yeah, exactly. I like a queen who commits even if it's to treachery. Yeah, I, yeah, I mean... Yeah, yeah, I'd rather have that. Again, her take, like, she made a choice. You know, she made a choice. I don't like the choice. But she made a choice, and she stuck to the choice. Um, you know, I, 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 I find that better than, than some other things. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Michelle, I, yeah, Michelle says he, uh, uh, she thinks he uh, portrays women favorably more often than not, so... Uh, she doubts it's just misogyny that makes him paint her so badly. Yeah, and this is, again, one of the reasons I wanted to bring this passage up, to remind you of that, right? If Lancelot has to be aware of the unsickerness of the world, it's going to be Guinevere who is... She is not only his tie back to the world, she is almost... A, like she is the representative of the world, right? She's the she is the face of the world, of that unsicker world that he's supposed to be aware of, in a sense. Um... Yeah. Um, anyway, okay. So, the other... I said two things. That was the first thing. Second thing um, is the commitment that Lancelot and Bors make to each other. So, Lancelot and Bors are the two who came closest to the Grail. Sir Bors was one of the three Grail Knights who actually achieved the Holy Grail. Lancelot was the runner-up of all of the Grail Knights, right? And the two of them who are the, are the two who return to the court, they have the, they share this bond, right? And of course, we know they're cousins, they're first cousins anyway. Um, and so they were always close anyhow. Um, this new bond between Lancelot and Bors is a big deal. And I just wanted to draw attention to the fact that the quest for the Holy Grail ends with this pledge of fellowship, companionship, and, you know, mutual bond between Bors and and Lancelot. Um, he will, he, Lancelot promises faithfully that he will never fail him. Um, and uh, ye and I shall never depart in sunder while our lives may last. And Bors is like, yep, me too. Right? Um, just wanted to remind you of that because there's a chance that that may become important later or even possibly sooner. So let's look at how the unstableness is actually depicted when it comes to it, right? So they've come back from the quest. Here, this is, so this is just starting in the second paragraph of tonight's reading. Then, as the book saith, Sir Launcelot began to resort unto Queen Guinevere again, 
and forgot the promise and the perfection that he made in the quest. For, as the book saith, had not Sir Launcelot been, in his privy thoughtes and in his mindes, so set inwardly to the queen as he was in seeming outward to God, there had no knecht passed him in the quest of the Sancria. But ever his thoughtes privily were on the queen, and so they loved to Gidders more hotter than they did to Forhand, and had many such privy drachtes to Gidder, that many in the court spak of it, and in especial Sir Agravine, Sir Gawaine's brother, for he was ever open-mouthed. So it befell that Sir Launcelot had many re resortes of ladies and damsels which daily resorted unto him, that besought him to be their champion. In all such matters of reeked, Sir Launcelot applied him daily to do for the pleasure of our Lord Jesu Christ, and ever as much as he miked, he withdrew him fro the company of Queen Guinevere, for to eschew the sclounder and noise. Wherefore the queen waxed wroth with Sir Launcelot. So on a day she called him to her chamber, and said thus, Sir Launcelot, I see and feel daily that your love beginneth to slack, for ye have no joy to be in my presence, but ever ye are out of this court, and quarrels and matters ye have nowadays for laddies, maidens, and gentlewomen, more than ever ye were wont to have beforehand. Okay. Um, uh, okay, so... This passage begins the first thing that I uh, uh, decided to fight uh, with a lot of Maori scholars about. And it was in the same direction. You won't be surprised because it's in the same direction that I've been arguing all along. I think especially, and this is the part now where I'm prepared to argue much more strongly. I was a little more wishy-washy back in the uh, 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 Elaine and the, the beginning of Galahad section. Um, I'm less wishy-washy here. Um, I... It has been traditional to read that first paragraph, uh, like their privy drachtes and stuff, as um, as euphemistic, right? I don't think that it's euphemistic. Um, I still do not believe that Lancelot and Guinevere are sleeping together. Um, well, we'll see more of why. The primary reason why is that when they sleep together, it's gonna they're gonna. The, Spoilers, Lancelot and Guinevere are going to sleep together, and it's going to be a big deal when they do. Um, notice that, notice the parallelism here, right? Lancelot is resorting privately to the, they're spending a lot of time together, right? Um, his thoughts were ever privily on the queen. That's what kept him from the Holy Grail in the first place, right? And they loved to get her as more hotter than they did to Forhand. He talked about his love. He repented of his love, right, in his confessions, uh, in the quest for the Holy Grail, um, that he loved her out of measure and out of measure long. You'll remember, right, was the phrase he used in his confession. He is indulging that love, again, more hotter than it was to forehand, right? They had many such previ drafts together. Now, what is a draft? Uh, what, what, what is a draft? that they're having together. Um, and that is, um, literally, it's like a path, a uh, walk, right? Um, they're having a, uh, what, um, uh, what Jane Austen would call a tete-a-tete, -tete, right? Uh, spending private time together alone. That is what is causing the scandal. Uh, there's not, there's no smoking gun here, right? No massive scandal has broken out yet. Had anyone strongly suspected uh, that they were hopping into bed together? And again, this will come up later. But at this point, we don't see any kind of evidence of that, right? Sir Agravain is singled out here as being ever open-mouthed. That is, he is quick to talk, and I love that expression, right, to be ever open-mouthed. He is quick to talk, right? He is making much out of what is, I think, as yet still not very much, right? They're spending a lot of time together, not just 
time in each other's company, right? But time separate, right? They are going off alone together. There is no smoking gun yet, right? Uh, there's, there's no, there is no, there is no nudity yet, right? No one is spying them and, uh, uh, and, uh, 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 panicking about this or raising a panic about this. There is only speculation. Gosh, um, it's not, everybody knew, right? Everyone was fine with Lancelot's love for the queen, right? Remember we talked about how there is certainly a model. Remember Percival's innocent declaration before King Mark, right? about Tristan and Isolde. We know that there is a model of love here, which is not love par amours, which is not love out of measure, but love in measure, right? The bond of affection between Lancelot and Guinevere, totally appropriate, and we will see it actively endorsed by King Arthur later on uh, in today's reading. Um, what is not okay is love paramours, is love out of measure, which leads at least to the suspicion or even indeed to the reality of uh, actual adulterous acts. So the concern here, again, is not that someone has caught them or someone is going to catch them in an absolutely compromising position. That's not the atmosphere of this. The atmosphere of this is people are going to start to talk that we are loving each other out of measure, right? Because if they loved each other in measure, they wouldn't be private all the time. It just wouldn't be a thing. It, and again, it's not even that's not even a quantity of love thing. It's not even a loving too much. It's loving of a different kind. If, if you have the kind of love that leads you to want to be alone together a lot, right? That's a bad sign. <laughs> that's a bad sign if she's the queen, right? There shouldn't be anything in their love for each other, which leads them to seek privacy, right? Um, that's, as I say, in itself, a bad sign. Um, so, and therefore one which will make people, especially open-mouthed people like Sir Agravain, talk. So you'll notice how the parallel movement, right? Lancelot says, okay, so here's what I'm going to do. I am going to uh, have uh, 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 work for many other ladies and damsels, right? I'm going to connect myself with many ladies and damsels in order to show, well, why is he doing this, right? Not to show that he's like a player who has all the ladies, right? But rather uh, to show that his uh, heart is not solely attached, right? If he's out there fighting for ladies all the time, right? Lots of ladies, ladies all over the place. Then there's no reason to think that he has completely and inappropriately dedicated himself in any particular direction, right? Uh, and you'll see that this works. You can tell this works because like, Guinevere is jealous, right? Uh, Guinevere herself is jealous, which again is kind of in his in its way a good sign, right? Good sign in the sense that um, it is uh, he is certainly succeeding in uh, 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 he is certainly succeeding in giving the impression that his heart is not totally locked. On Guinevere, right? That, of course, is only an outward seeming. That is not where his privy thoughts are. And Nancy, you are absolutely right. He did love her too much. He does. He, 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 his, his love for her, their love to Gitters is more hotter than it was beforehand, right? Um, and again, that tells you their hot love is a warning sign. Remember remember that boiling well that Galahad put his hand in? And the boiling of the water was, in, was a symbol of lust, right? But the purity of his chastity, the fire of the Holy Ghost in him that was his purity, that was his chastity, extinguished the flames. Not the flames. Extinguished the boiling heat, right? Of lust, of lechery. But it seems there's a certain amount of uh, boiling here in Lancelot's heart and presumably in Guinevere's heart as well. So, yeah, they have a questionable kind of love and a questionable deg degree of love. Absolutely. Um, I am just cautioning against too rapid a uh, reading between the lines here. I, in my experience, modern readers want to do this all over the place. Like... Um, 
modern readers tend to want to see almost any phrase as a euphemism for sex <laughs> in a situation like this. Like, and I'm just, I'm, I'm not convinced at all that that's the case. Um, again, it doesn't, to me, it doesn't really fit what we see here. Um, uh, the, again, the overall sort of shape of this and it is going to, it would make a bunch of the stuff that happens later kind of puzzling to me, uh, if they, if it were the case. Um, anyway, uh, but Nancy, you're absolutely right. He was thinking of her instead of God, right? It was his privy thoughts were set on her. And we see this is not a change. in. There is a sense in which Lancelot has not changed back, right? He's not undone what he did. Rather, the truth is coming out, right? He was not, he meant it mostly. He mostly meant it when he was repenting, when he was promising he would not go back to Guinevere. Um, he would not resort unto her again, and then he does, right? Um, is he being unstable? Is he changing his mind? Yes, but more importantly, um, he is exposing what was really in his heart, right? Which is that his heart was less, he mostly meant it, but he didn't 100% mean it. Um, and she yells at him. And yet, Tarlonio says her least favorite thing about this Guinevere is her determined lack of awareness. Seems a little clueless, right? Um, uh, we have seen Guinevere um, being highly prone to jealousy, right? And I, I know I've made this distinction before, but it's worth remembering. I mean jealousy in the medieval sense of the word jealousy. Um, jealousy, not, we tend to use the word jealousy when what we really mean is envy. That is when you want something that somebody else has and you look at somebody else's really nice car or, you know, ice cream cone or whatever it is. And you say, I want that. I wish I had that. I, I am jealous of them. For the, You're not genvious, jealous, you're envious, right? To be jealous is to be, je you know, is when you have an ice cream cone and your sibling says, can I have a bite? And you're like, no, it's my ice cream cone. Then you're being jealous, right? And that's what Guinevere is doing with Lancelot. Um, she is wanting to protect him, just like the, the claws came out really quick with Elaine, right? Um, and she got really mad at Lancelot because she was jealous, because he's hers, and she did not want to share him with Elaine. And now she's being jealous again in exactly the same way. Um, and, uh, okay, so, um, and again, that sort of the free bonus that comes with that distinction is understanding better the King James when uh, God in Exodus says that he is a jealous God. That's what he means. He is telling the Jews he will not share them with other gods. That's what that means. Not that he wants the things that other, God, that other gods have, right? Rather, the Israelites are his and he won't share them is what he's saying when he says, I, the Lord, your God, am a jealous God. Anyway, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, anyway, I Look at her. She's not only jealous, she's also snide, right? I see and feel daily that your love beginneth to slake, right? Um, are you over me, Lancelot? Right? Are you moving on? Um, the thing that I would emphasize about that, it is clear Guinevere is clueless. And Tarlonio, coming back to the point that you made, because I think it's a good one, Guinevere's determined lack of awareness, right? Guinevere is clueless here. But I think that that's important on more than one level, right? On the one hand, like, she's clueless to what he, he's being prudent, right? Just basic prudence. I'm trying to throw people off the scent, right? So that people like Agravain don't start spreading rumors about us, right? That's all he's doing, right? So, you know, you got to think Lancelot is kind of like, dude, honey, come on now, right? Like, track with me, right? This just, just, you know, we're just being cautious here, right? Don't, don't, you know, uh, don't misunderstand. But remember, Guinevere is also, and perhaps more importantly, 
more deeply clueless on the higher sense, right? Lancelot knows what he should do. Lancelot knows that their love is wrong. I'm not saying she's not aware that adultery is a sin, but again, like, he has been called to leave it behind. He confessed. He confessed that he loved her out of measure and out of measure long, right? Um, no, remember both halves of that confession? Out of measure, my love for her was inappropriately excessive. I crossed the line, right, in my love for her. And also out of measure long, and I've been doing it for decades now. It's not just like a thing that overcame me briefly and then I snapped to my senses, right? I've been living there, right? I, I built the house there and have been living in that house for 24 years, right? So it's not just that I crossed the line. I then staked out my territory on the other side of that line, right? Both of those things are the things that Lancelot is repenting when he repents. Um, Guinevere, not only has Guinevere not repented, there is no evidence that Guinevere even gets it, right? I mean, again, like, does she know that adultery is wrong? Yeah, is a sin? Yeah, sure. I get, but, I get, but that's not the point, right? Um, the point is... Well, okay, actually, sure. Kind of that is the point. Uh, at, at the very least, that's a little bit the point, right? Because the whole, uh, that's true if you're thinking about it from the point of view of Christian morality, but that's much less obviously true if you're coming at it from the point of view of the courtly love tradition, which says that adultery is awesome, right? Uh, we've seen from old days, right, that Lancelot rejected that system, that Lancelot was setting himself to be a higher le moral level of knight, right, Who, that Lancelot didn't play like that, except he did, right, he ended up uh, doing that, crossing those lines and living there afterwards. Um, Guinevere, we see no evidence that Guinevere has ever rejected it. She seems to be living in that world like Tristan and his old live in that world, both very happily, I mean, contentedly, that is to say, um, as far as uh, as far as we can see. And you're absolutely right, Nancy. She doesn't have a helpful hermit to help her get to that point. Absolutely true. Absolutely true. Um, uh, and um, uh, <laughs> David, you're right. David says, we finally get the number of years since Lancelot has been knighted, uh, so we can picture him and Guinevere and Arthur uh, in their late 40s or 50s. Yes, except for the fact, did you notice when we saw the knight, he fights in the tournament against the knight who is the son of Alexander Le Orphelin, that is, the grandson of the knight who's younger than Tristram. <laughs> Right? Remember how we like sped up that generation to get to Alexander Le Orphelin, and now like his son is around, right? I mean, yeah. Um, anyway, it's just it's still chronology, still not Mallory's number one primary emphasis. Um, but anyhow, um, so the cluelessness. Back to Guinevere's cluelessness. I mean that word very deliberately, right? She has no clue. She does not have the key to what his issue is, right? Because there are, for Lancelot, there are two levels of things going on here, right? A, I want to be discreet so that we don't cause trouble, right? F because of the open mouthedness of folks like Sir Agravain. And on the other hand, I repented of this. I, this is wrong. And I know this is wrong. I'm still doing it because I can't help myself. But I know this is wrong. Right. Guinevere's not even there. So I think my theory, Tarlonio, is that her cluelessness, I mean, like the, the, the uh, frankly, empty headedness with which she seems to respond to, like, almost everything that Lancelot does here. Right. She seems super dense. Um, 
I think that that's deliberate. Not that he's deliberately depicting her as stupid, but she's out of the loop, right? She's not understand. Like there are layers and levels of things going on. There's the outward seeming and there's the privy thoughts. And she, so like, you know, he's operating on multiple dimensions and she is, everything's simple for her still. It seems she's not had that moment. She's not had that moment of conviction. Um, she's not even there at all. Um, and again, all I can say in the defense of that is that uh, eventually she'll get there. She'll get there. Um, yeah. Um, Bruce, it's that's a super hard question to answer. Um, is Maori going against the social mores of his day in his stance against the courtly love tradition? So, one of the things which people have a really hard time with is trying to understand or figure out to exactly what extent did people take any of this stuff seriously, right? That is to say, is all of this courtly love stuff a reflection of the general attitude? Like, does it demonstrate the fact that they told all these courtly love stories, people running around having adultery and having no problems with it. Um, well, I mean, everybody except the, <laughs> the except the, the injured husbands in the stories. Everybody else doesn't have any problems with it. Um, is this a reflection of the fact that the society, the society doesn't really care about that? Um, or is it just a kind of game? And it's clear that they do care from the other thing. It's, it's really, there, people have different opinions on that subject. So there are plenty of um, voices who are very resistant to and opposed to those kinds of courtly love concepts. Um, so Maori is certainly not unique in that. But Lancelot is a little different. Lancelot is a little bit weird in some ways. That is to say, most of the people who are against it just like preach against it, like often our church folks and who are, you know, saying like, you shouldn't even read this kind of story because it's wicked. Um, the way in which Maori is going a little bit more out of his way to kind of subvert it from within by establishing Lancelot as this kind of new paradigm is a little bit more unusual. Um, still not unknown, but a little bit more unusual. Um, yeah. <laughs> Gary is wondering if I'm saying that Guinevere has no thoughts to keep privy. Uh, well, something like that. Um, something like that. Uh, yeah. 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 And Carrie, you're absolutely right. It, it's not just, of course, as we were talking about, as we were joking about before, it's not just that she hasn't had the benefit of the instruction of hermits. Um, she wasn't part of that world, right? While... Lancelot and the others were off on the quest for the Holy Grail where the entire world was turned upside down in ways that we discussed before. Um, more in line, more, you know, a, a radical advance on Lancelot's earlier moral protestations. Guinevere's been home, right? Guinevere never left the old world. Um, and that's still... Um, so in that sense also, her, her reality is still kind of more one-dimensional. Um... Anyway, let's uh, look at Lancelot's response. Ah, madam, sighed Sir Lancelot, in this ye must hold me excused for divers causes. On is, I was but lot in the quest of the Sancreal, and I thank God of his great mercy, and never of my deserving, that I saw in that quest as much as ever saw any sinful man living. And so it, so was it told me. And if that I had not had my privy thoughtes to return to your love again as I do, I had seen as great mysteries as ever saw my son Sir Galahad, Percival, other Sir Bors. And therefore, madam, I was but lot in the quest, and wit you well, madam, it may not ye be yet leakly forgotten the high service in whom I did diligent labour. Also, madam, Wit you well that there be many men spaketh of our love in this court, and have you and me greatly in a white, and these as these Sir Agravine and Sir Mordred, 
and madam, wit you well, I dread them more for your sake than for any fear I have, uh, I, I have of them myself, for I may happen to escape and ride myself in a great need, where, madam, ye must abide all that will be said unto you. And then, if that ye fall in any distress throughout willful folly, then is there none other help but by me and my blood. And wit you well, madam, the boldness of you and me will bring us to sham and sclounder, and that were me loth to see you dishonour it. And that is the cause I tack upon me more for to do for damsels and maidens than ever I did to foreign, that men should understand my joy and my delight is my pleasure to have ado for damsels and maidens. Note, um, note his double answer here, right? There are divers causes why he's doing this, right? One answer is that because it's prudent. Use your brain, right? Use what brains you have and see that we're going to be in trouble and not just we, you are going to be in trouble. He's like, I'm not worried for myself, right? And the worst comes to worst, he can always run. She can't run, right? Um, you must abide all that will be said unto you. Now, notice it's not, he's not saying, I'm afraid you're going to die. He sees fairly clearly what the potential is, what is going to happen. He knows exactly what will happen. Should the day ever come that Guinevere is openly accused of treason, openly accused of adultery against the king, what will happen is that he, Lancelot, will have to rescue her, right? There is none other help but by me and my blood. I and my kinsmen are going to have to come in and rescue you against all the other knights of the round table. And the result will be the shattering of the Arthurian court, right? He will have to rebel against Arthur. He'll have to divide the court, set half of it against the other, and all will descend into chaos. He sees this perfectly clearly. And remember all those things we talked about before, about those other knights like Sir Gareth, um, like Alexander Le Orphelin, like La Cote Maltile, right, who owe their fealty primarily to Lancelot first and Arthur second, right? A huge division in the Arthurian court if Lancelot should be forced to take up arms against Arthur and his knights and his justice, right? Now, um, uh, oh yeah, Carita, when he says slander, uh, the word slander here just means um, people like saying bad things. It's like rumor. It, it, you know, I, I, the, 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 the slander. Is it still slander if it's true? Yeah, like any like bad speech, right? It's, uh, he's not using this in any kind of a sort of a technical legal sense. Uh, he just means like if people are, are, are speaking slander against you. If people are speaking openly um, uh, uh, bad things against you. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, so, okay. So that's um, the one thing, right? He sees and spells out for her what the consequences would be. We must avoid that. And so he explains his strategy, right? The boldness of you and me will bring us to shame and slander. That is our, our boldness in, you know, seeking private meetings with each other where others can see and where anyone who has any kind of a malicious turn could make accusation, right? Because, again, that's really the problem. It's not that anything has... Uh, there, there, there haven't been... There's, again, there's no smoking gun, Right. But there is enough that if somebody were motivated to try to make it into a slanderous narrative, they could, right? Anyone who chose to do that could choose. They're leaving themselves open to that. So, loath, me loath to see you dishonored. Um, 
He wants men to understand that his joy and delight is his pleasure to have ado for damsels and maidens. I am the defender of all women, right? Notice what he's trying to do there is shift the narrative, right? If this is the narrative about Lancelot, oh yeah, no, look, he's all about helping ladies, right? Helping ladies is what he does. Then his relationship with Guinevere will be understood under that kind of narrative umbrella, right? That's what Lancelot does. He helps ladies, right? So presumably, you know, this proves a... He can't love Guinevere out of measure, right? If he loved Guinevere Paramore, he'd be totally dedicated to her and not be fighting for all these other damsels all the time because that's not how it works, right? But also, if he then, like if we see him fighting for Guinevere, it's not because he loves her paramours. It's because fighting for ladies is what he does, right? So notice that he's not only making it less likely that he's going to have to fight for her, he's also making it more likely that if he does have to fight for her, it won't be itself taken as evidence of his own, of their, of their guilt, right? So it's really not a very bad plan. Um... Uh, as far as the plan goes. But notice that that's only his second reason, right? The second reason is the strategy. The first reason is his confession, right? Is his experience in the Grail quest. Um, one reason, one reason why you must hold me excused for defending these ladies, right, for spending so much, dedicating so much of my time and effort, uh, helping other other maidens and damsels, is I was but lot in that quest, and it may not be lately forgotten. He confesses to her that he is still torn. Lancelot there is still a big part of Lancelot that wants to give her up. So, Carrie, you're absolutely right that none of his reasons uh, are presented in terms of endearment uh, that their long relationship had earned her. No. He doesn't say, Honey, come on now, right? You know how much I love you. That's not in doubt, right? Surely, you know, you don't let yourself doubt that, right? Just remember it's strategy and whatever. He doesn't do that at all. He does almost the opposite of that, right? If not for the fact that my heart was still privily set on you, I would have achieved the Holy Grail, right? Um, I dedicated myself to holy things, and that can't be lightly forgotten. I promised to give you up, and I haven't given you up. But I can't totally forget my promise to give you up. So... If she's upset, if she sees this as a bad sign, what he's doing, she's not completely wrong. Now, she is completely wrong if she's thinking like, oh, so you're you're over me, right? You're looking for like somebody younger, right? Uh, you're hanging out with these maidens and damsels because you're playing the field, right? That's wrong. That's completely wrong. But if... Uh, when she's feeling that his love begins to slake, she's not, com she is less completely wrong. But it's not even that simple. His love isn't just fading. Right? His love isn't slaked like your thirst when you have a drink. Right? He's not getting over her. He is still with part of his heart trying to give her up. So it's not the same. It's not how she depicts it. But again, she is not 100% by his own confession here. He is not, she is not 100% wrong <laughs> to be upset about what he's doing. Um, All this while, the queen stood still and let, let Sir Launcelot say what he would. And one he had said, and one he had all sighed, she brast out of weeping. And so she sobbed and a wept a great while, and one she meek speak, she sighed, Sir Launcelot, 
Now I will understand that thou art a false recreed knight and a common lecherer, and livest and holdest with other laddies, and of me thou hadst disdain and scorn, for wit thou well, now I understand thy falsehood, I shall never love thee more, and look thou be never so hardy to come in my seat, and reeked here I discharge thee this court, that thou never come within it, and I forfend thee my fellowship, and upon pain of thy head, that thou see me never more. Reek so Sir Launcelot departed with great heaviness, that oneth he meeked sustain himself for great dole mocking. Now, um, yes, yeah, Stephen says, I don't think she quite understood. No, no, she doesn't. She doesn't quite understand. But at the same time, she kind of does a little bit, right? I, she's On the one hand, she's wildly missing the point, right? But on the other hand, um, notice what, what's the outcome of this? This whole situation began with him returning from the Grail Quest, where he promised he would never come into her company again, right? But he did come into her company. And as he's back in her company, he starts to love her more hotter than he did beforehand, Right. But he's trying to resist and he's not want, not not want to let things spiral out of control. Right. Both outwardly and inwardly. Right. And so he's struggling with this. And in, in the end, what does she do? Kicks him out of her company so that he should never see her again, which is where he was supposed to be in the first place. Right. If he goes along with this and is like, you know what? Totally right. Uh, I that's what I should have been doing anyway. Right. Um. Uh, and yet it's like so near and yet so that, there's an irony in that right and yet again um, it is almost like she was just like not listening to anything he said but again I don't think that's the point the point I think is not that Guinevere is stupid the point is to emphasize the framework that she's coming from she only has one she doesn't get that spiritual stuff that he was saying is like, boom, she doesn't get it. Right? She doesn't see it. She only has one way of interpreting the world. She's still, she never went to that other place. She never had her world turned upside down. She is still playing the game. Right? And when your lover starts talking like this, right? It makes sense to be okay no i i know there's there's a there's a simple and obvious explanation for this right and that is that you're playing the field right uh you're uh you know sussing out all these other damsels right to try to find my replacement well i don't think so right you're a common lecturer and a recreated knight um uh you livest uh and lovest and holdest other ladies right okay okay um, Lynn, why does he call her madam and not queen? I think that's really important. Um, I think that's really important because madam, so queen would be a super awkward thing for him to call her, <laughs> right? Um, a big part of their relationship is premised, about, that is their shady relationship, is premised upon him not thinking of her as his queen. In as much as she is his queen, what he is doing is treason, right? She is his lady, and that's okay, right? If you can kind of... If, what carrying on this way necessitates is him having to divide his head like that, right? Um, I'm not thinking of her as my queen. I'm thinking of her as my lady. I am thinking of her as um, the one who has this sort of amorous authority over me, right? Um, and madam is what... Uh, madam is the, is the opposite of sir, right? 
my lord, um, which is what you would call your superior, right? What you, you would call the person who, uh, to whom you have sworn fealty, madam, is what he calls her, because that's the female equivalent of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly. And no, Arthur, I think if we're thinking of uh, the title of Madam uh, for a brothel keeper is definitely something that should be far from your mind in this conversation. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, <laughs> Karina, I like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Karina's summarizing her responses. Uh, you can't dump me because I'm dumping you. Um, the Karina, that does sound like what she sounds like, right? Like from her point of view, that sounds like exactly what's happening. The speech that he just gave, how are you supposed to parse that? Right? I mean, the second part you could parse, either part you could parse. How do you parse them both? I mean, what he was just doing was openly stating both halves of his mind. Part of me says, I know I really should give you up. I, I, I should. We shouldn't be hanging out. What we're doing is wrong. The other part of me says, we need to be smart about it, right? To prevent disaster from, from happening. You know, yeah. Um, but Jennifer, you're right. That to me is one of the big ironies of this whole situation, right? As wrong as she is, Jennifer says, if she just stuck to this and Lancelot had actually stayed away, disaster might have been averted. Yeah, yeah. Um, she could have been unwittingly the instrument of his successful repentance, right? Um Banished from her company is precisely where he ought to be uh, for everybody's good, for his own spiritual good, for the good of the court. Right. Absolutely. Um, yeah. So, no. So, Michelle, I think that he's not subtly reminding her of her position. I think he's doing the opposite. Right. By not calling her queen, he is not reminding her of her position, right? If he called her my queen, then he'd be reminding her of her position, which would be all manner of awkward, right? Instead, he is talking to her like a courtly lover would talk to his lady. Um, that's how I read the madam form of address. Yeah, Marilyn, it is her only means of punishing him. And yet, of course, it's ironically would be kind of the best case scenario. Then we get the twist, right? And the twist is when Guinevere decides that turnaround is fair play, and she clearly is not so stupid that she doesn't understand the um, advantage of showing that their connection, the connection between Lancelot and Guinevere is not exclusive, right? They don't just focus, they're not just focused inappropriately on each other, uh, they're part of this larger loving community, right? So she's going to invite all these knights and make a dinner for them. And then someone drops dead, right? It's all fun and games until somebody brasts. Um, uh, somebody swells up and brasts, which is a super awkward thing to happen at a dinner party you'll allow. Um, here's Gawain after the dinner. My lady, the queen, sighed Sir Gawain. Madam, wit you that this dinner was mad for me and my fellowers, for all folkes that canoeth my condition understand that I love well fruit, and now I see well I had neither be slain. Therefore, madam, I dread me, lest ye wall be shamed. Then the queen stood still, and was so sore abashed that she wist not what to say. This shall not so be ended, sighed Sir Mador de la Porte, for here have I lost a full noble knecht of my blood, and therefore upon this sham and despite I will be revenged to the utterance. And there openly Sir Mador appealed the queen of the death of his cousin Sir Patrice. Appealed is a super important word there. That is a legal term, right? He has openly and officially charged her with the crime. Right. She has a, he has formally accused her, legally accused her of murder, of the death of his cousin, Sir Patrice. Then stood they all still. Right. They're like, whoa, an official legal complaint was just made. That's serious. This is not just like he's upset and popping off. Right. This, he, it's, it's done. Right. 
It's 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 done. Um, then stood they all still, that none would speak a word against him, for they all had great suspicion unto the queen, because she let mark that dinner. And the queen was so abashed that she could none otherwise do, but wept so heartily that she fell on a swoke. So with this noise and cry come to them King Arthur, and one he wist of the trouble, he was a passing heavy man. And ever Sir Mador stood still before the king and appealed the queen of treason. For the custom was such at that time that all manner of shameful death was called treason. Um, David, I do suspect that we get the term appellate court from that word. I, that's my suspicion. I'm not 100% positive, but I, 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 I suspect that. Um, yeah. Yeah, Stephen, where Gil isn't going to do the trick anymore, right? That's not how you patch these things over these days. Um, but yeah, no, that's, that seems to be the issue. So this looks really bad. She invited them all and this guy's poisoned at her feast, right? This knight is poisoned at her feast. Sir Gawain thinks the poison was intended for him because he's a known fruit lover and it was fruit. It was apples that were poisoned. Um, and of course he's right. Uh, but that's not the point. The point is one of her guests at her feast was poisoned and it's a fair accusation, right? It looks really bad. And all of them have a great suspicion unto the queen. They can't prove that she didn't do it. It looks but there are they were all there, right? We were at this feast. That could have been us, right? Um she now could be called a great destroyer of knights, like other ladies have been called that in the past. Um Yeah, Nancy says, and here she is doing some, uh, here she's doing some probably shady stuff, but she's getting punished for doing something actually good and trying to make things nice. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's the irony, right? The irony is her intentions were good, in fact, right? Uh, and we know, in fact, we see this is her kind of coming around, right? Even to Lancelot's own way of thinking. And now she's in, uh, now she's in big trouble. Um, Arthur's exchange with Guinevere here is fascinating. Where is Sir Launcelot? said King Arthur. And he were here. He will not grudge to do battle for you. Um, he has already explained. He can't fight for her. He has to be the judge. He can't fight for her. This, remember that I've been saying, right, like the love between Lancelot and Guinevere is not necessarily wrong. Like there is a positive model here. This is it. This is why Arthur not only accepts Sir Lancelot, is not only okay with the love, so long as it doesn't cross the line, between Lancelot and Guinevere, he supports it. Right? He's glad of it because his wife needs a champion. Queens need champions. If a queen doesn't have the champion, nobody can defend her. She's vulnerable because the king, by law, can't defend his own wife. Right? And so her husband cannot be her champion. That would be true for, you know, uh, uh, your husband would be, you know, hopefully number one on the list of people who would serve as your champion most of the time. But with the queen, because of this sort of legal loophole, he cannot be. So she must have a champion. So that's fine. Again, not only fine, but good. And Arthur not only doesn't dislike Lancelot for his attachment to his wife, he appreciates it. He's glad of it. He's grateful for it. Right? So look at the attitude here as he is chiding her. Where is Sir Launcelot? said King Arthur. And he were here, he would not grutch to do battle for you. He wouldn't complain about it. He'd jump in and fight for you. Sir, said the queen, I wot not where he is. 
which is technically true. But his brother and his kinsmen deem that he be not within this realm. That me repenteth, said King Arthur, for and he were here, he will soon stint this strife. Well, then I will counsel you, said the king, that ye go unto Sir Bors, and pray him for to do battle for you, for Sir Launcelot is sack. And upon my life he will not refuse you, for well I see, said the king, that none of the four and twenty knictes that were at your dinner, where Sir, P Sir Patrice was slain, that will do battle for you, neither none of him will say well of you, and that shall be great sclounder to you in this court. Alas, sighed the queen, and I may not do withal, but now I miss Sir Launcelot, for if he were here, he will soon put me in my heart's ease. Oh, what a sentence there that is. What aileth you, sighed the king, that ye cannot keep Sir Launcelot upon your side? For wit you well, sighed the king, who that hath Sir Launcelot upon his party hath the most man of worship in this world upon his side. Now go your way, said the king unto the queen, and require Sir Bors to do battle for you, for Sir Launcelot is sack. Appeal to him in the name of the love of Sir Launcelot, right? Because Launcelot would totally fight for you. So again, notice Arthur's attitude towards this whole thing, right? Um... What's wrong with you? Why can't you get along with Sir Lancelot? Why can't you be nicer to Sir Lancelot, says Arthur to his wife, right? Now, in large part, there's irony here, right? And we're supposed to hear and feel that irony. But at the same time, what we can see lurking behind that, the force of that irony, is that positive model, right? That's there, which Arthur is 100% in support of. We get this glimpse from Arthur's perspective of how this is meant to work, right? Of what a loving the queen within measure would look like, right? And her reciprocating that affection, gratitude, kindness, right? It could be beautiful, should be beautiful, right? And Arthur, from where Arthur's sitting, it is beautiful, except his wife keeps, like, driving Lancelot away for some reason, Right? What is wrong with her? Yeah. Um, you see why none of the four and twenty knights who were at the feast are willing to fight for her? Remember they've sworn an oath not to fight in a wrongful quarrel. Right? The problem is the evidence of their own eyes. Like, one way to think about this. Every single knight who was at that feast could theoretically be, were this like a modern courtroom, right? They could be called as prosecution witnesses against Guinevere, right? They know that they could be called as prosecution witnesses against Guinevere. Um, if they had to testify about the facts of this case as they know it, they would have to testify that it sounds like Guinevere is guilty. And so therefore, they cannot, in keeping with their oath, of knighthood not to fight in a wrongful quarrel, they can't. Because they have no positive reason to think that she is innocent. They have no evidence that she... And what they do know suggests that she's guilty. Right? Um, so, it's, uh, it's difficult. Notice, I think, that some of the knights involved are, go a little past that. Right? Some of the knights in question are not just honor bound to not fight for her. Some of them are actively suspicious of her. Some of them are ready to believe this of her. Um, that's definitely a um, that's definitely a factor. Um, and yeah, Carrie, exactly. Lancelot's recent activity makes Arthur's statement the more uh, uh, applicable, right? Um, why can't you keep Lancelot on your side? Because like literally every other <laughs> lady in the court has Lancelot on her side, right? Um, why is it that now Lancelot is fighting for everyone, but he's no longer fighting for you? <laughs> What's wrong with you, lady? Yeah, yeah. But 
But Bors agrees to do it, right? Because he says he believes that her intention was pure, right? That she didn't, you know, he believes that she didn't do it. Uh, so he's willing to fight for her. But of course, he and Lancelot said it because Lancelot has not gone very far away. Do you notice where he's staying? He's staying with a hermit who's right nearby. Did you catch the name of the hermit? Were you paying close attention? Who is the hermit that Lancelot was staying with? It's an old, old friend. Did you catch it? Oh, it's tricky. It is a B name. It is a B name. It was Sir Brastius. Sir Brastius. Remember Sir Brastius and Sir Ulfius, Uther Pendragon's friends, right? The like Uther Pendragon's wingman at the conception of Arthur, right? That guy, Sir Brastius. He's retired now and become a hermit, like you do, right? Um, like it's uh, you know, just as like all the great you know, like professional athletes retire and become announcers, right? So all the greatest knights retire and become hermits and leeches, right? It's 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 what you do. Yeah, uh, I, I was I, I always love it when Sir Brastius shows back up again. Um, he's way past fighting age now. Uh, time has apparently caught up with Sir Brastius finally, um, but he's still a, a good hermit. Um, anyhow, so. Uh, Okay, so anyway, so, so Lancelot comes and fights and defeats Sir Mador uh, de la Porte, uh, who is then, of course, compelled to confess that uh, Guinevere is innocent. And then he put off his helmet to drink, and then every canique knew him that it was Sir Launcelot. And anon, as the king wist that, he took the queen in his hand and yawed unto Sir Launcelot and said, Sir, grant mercy of your great travail that ye have had this day for me and for my queen. My lord, said Sir Launcelot, wit you well, I ought have reeked ever to be in your quarrel, and in my laddies the queen is quarrel to do but hail, for ye are the man that gaff me the high order of, order of Knechthod, and that die, my laddie, your queen, did me worship. And Ellis had I been shamed, for that some die that ye mad me Knecht, through my hastiness I lost my sword. And my laddie, your queen, found it and lapped it in her train, and gave me my sword when I had need thereto, and else had I been shamed among all Canictus. And therefore, my lord Arthur, I promised her at that die ever to be her Canict in reeked other in wrong. Grant mercy, said the king, for this journey. And weet you, and weet you well, said the king, I shall acquit your goodness. And evermore the queen beheld Sir Launcelot, and wept so tenderly that she sank almost to the ground for sorrow, that he had done her so great kindness, where she showed him great unkindness. Then the connectors of his blood drew unto him, and there either of them made great joy of other, and so come all the connectors of the table round, and were at that time, and welcomed him. Okay. Um, yes, Jennifer, on the surface, a happy ending. Right now, first of all, the story of when Lancelot and Guinevere first fall in love, when Lancelot first falls in love with Guinevere is adorable. Isn't that adorable? Right? At his knighting, he lost his sword. Right? Uh, I so relate to this. Right? Um, uh, as a very forgetful person, uh, you know, I have all kinds of empathy for... Uh, the frantic Sir Lancelot who, like, at the time of his knighting can't find his own sword, right? He's about to be shamed forever and she finds it and she doesn't just give it to him, she hides it. She slips it to him, right? She laps it in her train. So she conceals his sword in her gown, right? Which sounds kind of symbolic, Dr. Freud. Anyway, sorry. But anyhow, sure, she hides it, right? And she sneaks it to him so that nobody knows that he forgot his sword, right? And from that day, he promised that he would always be her knight, right? And he tells this story. He tells this story to Arthur, right? I have been her devoted knight ever since that day, and I will always be her knight, right? So here, thinking back to Arthur's words and about how much he needs 
Lancelot for Guinevere's sake, right? Lancelot is not only the great support of Arthur in the sense that on the battlefield, if any other king is going to cause any troubles, right, they're going to have Lancelot to deal with. That's very handy, right, for Arthur and his reign. But in addition, right, he is, um, uh, again, he can't fight for Guinevere, right? So the fact that this knight, his greatest knight, is dedicated to be the champion of his queen is best case scenario, right? Completely optimal, because now he can know that nobody can mess around and accuse his wife of stuff, right? Um, frivolously, because Lancelot is going to be there to defend her as he, Arthur, cannot. Um, yeah, yeah. You're right, Lynn. Sometimes a sword is just a sword. I totally agree. Um, anyway. The description... Of the, as Arthur and Lancelot are talking about this and Guinevere, the description of Guinevere's look, right, and the tears in her eyes as she is looking at him, her gratitude to him for his graciousness to her when she was ungracious to him, her his kindness in the face of her unkindness. Um, this is um, this is kind of sweet. This is this is very nice, right? Um, on the one hand, I find this moment uncomfortable. Uncomfortable because we know that Lancelot and Guinevere's love has crossed the line. We know that they are deceiving Arthur, and it's awkward, right, um, to see Arthur being kind of, from that perspective, made a fool of here. But to me, that's not 100% the force of this scene. Right. There is a significant sense, I think, in which this scene shows. It's even more poignant, I think, because it shows how things could be, how they might have been, how maybe they still could possibly be. Right. Um, yeah. Awkward, but awkward, but it's tragic, not slimy, right? Lancelot's not deceiving Arthur here. He's being honest with Arthur. Um, he's not telling Arthur everything, but he's being honest, right? Um, the fact that certainly Lancelot's intentions are not completely corrupted, Right. Neither are they completely pure, but they're not completely corrupted is to me kind of a big deal here in this process. All right. Time for the best epitaph of all time. Thon was Sir Patrice buried in the Church of Westminster in a tomb, and thereupon was written. Here lieth Sir Patrice of Ireland, slain by Sir Pina le Savage, that empoisoned Apollos to have slain Sir Gawain, and by misfortune Sir Patrice ate one of the apples, and then suddenly he brast. <laughs> Best epitaph ever. Also, there was written upon the tomb that Queen Guinevere was a peeled of treason of the death of Sir Patrice by Sir Mador de la Porte, and there was mad the mention who Sir Launcelot fucked with him for Queen Guinevere and overcome him in plain battle. All this was written upon the tomb of Sir Patrice in excusing of the queen. And Thon Sir Mador sued daily and long to have the queen as good grassa, and so by the meanness of Sir Launcelot he caused him to stand in the queen as good grass, and all was forgiven. Um, yeah, Nancy's absolutely the return of the huge tombstones, right? They, they, I hope they built a nice big tomb uh, for Sir Patrice of Ireland because uh, uh, he needs a lot of space to get all this carved out. Um, <laughs> yeah, Zach, you're right. They were not paying by the letter on that stone. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, they... 
Lancelot insists when he accepts the surrender of Sir Mador de la Porte that it gets properly written down on the tomb, right, for posterity about what happened here. And we get the entire story, right, uh, written in on the tomb of Sir Patrice of Ireland um, in excusing of the queen, right? Thus ends the first accusation of treason against the queen. Remember Maori's little protestation, right? Any kind of wrongful death was called treason in those days, right? Um, this is only the accusation of treason, of sort of technical treason, right? She's going to be appealed of the big treason, actual treason, right, later on. Um, but this whole scene is the foreshadowing, right? It is an illustration of the situation that she is in, right? The risks and dangers of their situation. Um, how quickly things can turn, Um how she was accused and how she was excused. And so everything's fine, so long as everything's fine, right? Um, but clearly we should have some senses of ominous foreshadowing here, both because of the events and, of course, because of their own exchanges here uh, and what we see about their relationship. Well, let's keep going. So the king is going to a big tournament and Lance and the Queen is not going, and Lancelot stays behind. And remember, it's the Queen who upbraids Lancelot now, right? Um, she comes to Lancelot and says, "What are you, an idiot? Right? If I stay back and you stay, but we both make excuses to stay back when Arthur and the rest of the court go away, everyone's going to talk about this, right? They're going to be like, oh, look who's seeking an excuse to be together, right? So get out of here,' she says." Because everyone's going to so, you know, um, and he and Lancelot makes that crack about like you are but lately grown wise. Right. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah. OK, so he goes. Lancelot goes, but he goes in secret. And he goes in secret and he lodges in a town called Astolot. And so, by the way, the king lodged at a town that was called Astolot. That is in English, Guilford. Ah, what other... Mythgard Academy character is reputedly from Guilford. We've got the fair maiden of Astolat and Ford Prefect. Um, uh, yes, exactly. Ford Prefect was from Guilford. Well, reputedly from Guilford. Um, anyway, sorry. Um, that is in English, Guilford, and there the king lie in the castle. So when the king was departed, the queen called Sir Launcelot unto her and said thus, Sir, ye are greatly to blame thus to hold you behind my lord. What will your enemies and mine say and deem? See how Sir Launcelot holdeth him ever behind the king, and so the queen doth also, for that they would have their pleasure to getters. Now notice she's going there. Right. She goes, she's, they're going to, this, they're going to, this, oh, it's going to be like evidence. Right. They're going to think we're sleeping together. Oh my goodness. And thus will they say, said the queen. Have ye no doubt, madam, said Sir Launcelot, I allow your wit. Right. I'm with you. Right. Um, it is of lat come since ye were waxing so wise. And therefore, madam, at this time I will be ruled by your counsel, and this night I will tuck my rest, and tomorrow betime I will tuck my way toward Winchester. But with ye well, said Sir Launcelot unto the queen, at that justice I will be against the king, and against all his fellowship. Sir, ye may there do as ye list, said the queen, but be my counsel, ye shall not be against your king and your fellowship, for there been full many hardy knictes of your blood. Madam, sighed Sir Launcelot, I shall tuck the adventure that God will give me. Um, yeah, so both James and Nancy are concerned that Launcelot himself is being 
dumb here. Like he's the oblivious one. Um, doesn't going in secret defeat the purpose of not staying home, says James Stevens. Now, um, no, no, I don't think it would defeat the purpose. It wouldn't defeat the purpose because, so, I don't remember if I have this particular sentence on a future slide, so I'll just say it in case I don't. When, when Gawain and Arthur are watching, right, and Lancelot in disguise is doing wondrous deeds, right, and Gawain is like, man, look at that guy. That guy's incredible, right? I wonder who he is. Remember what Arthur says? Arthur says, I think we will hear more of this night, right? We will hear more about who he is by the end of the day. Um... I, uh, I think that Arthur assumes Lancelot's going to reveal himself, kind of like he did at the end of the fight with Sir Mador de Laporte, right? He uh, came in disguise, right, and remained in disguise until the end of the battle, and he takes off his helmet, right, to get a drink of water, and everybody recognizes him, right? It's not his purpose to remain disguised forever, and I don't think he meant to stay disguised forever here either. I kind of suspect that Arthur's right, that he was going to reveal himself at the end of the day, which would have, therefore, not defeated the purpose of him not staying at home, right? Uh, he would have revealed the fact, because, yeah, like it's his purpose. The reason I think that is that it's his purpose to make it known that he was there the whole time, right? Um, so that they, there will not be slander. There will not be any open mouths flapping about him and Guinevere hanging off back at home together. So that's all fine. I got no problems with that. The real question is, I'm tracking with you, Lancelot, right up to the point where you say you're going to be against the king and his fellowship. Why? 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 Lan or Guinevere says, that's stupid, man. Right? That is foolish. There have been full many hotter day knictes of your blood. You're going to fight against all of your kin if you do that. And some of them are, you know, pretty good. They might hurt you. That would be stupid to do that. To which he's like, I shall take the adventure that God will give me. Yeah, Dolorous Stroke, just like Sir Balin, right? And we saw how that panned out. On the one hand, when we hear Lancelot say he's going to be against the king and against all his fellowship, we should be remembering, right, all of those earlier times, like that time with Sir Palamides, with Gareth and Tristram and Sir Dinadan, when they were at, um, uh, when they were at the, uh, what was this, the tournament at Lana Zep, right? Um, when they said they were going to go fight on the weaker side because that was, uh, uh, would be more to their worship, right? Okay. Kind of makes sense. But what else should we be remembering? What else should we be remembering? When we hear Lancelot say that he's going to, be against the king and all his fellowship. Exactly, Devora. We should be remembering the white knights and the black knights. Exactly the mistake that Lancelot made was fighting for the wrong side. Right? And fighting for the wrong side for the wrong reasons. Right? And Devora, who's on the other side of him? Sir Boris, Mr. I will always be with you, right? They, they, he swore that he would always be with Sir Boris, right? Sir Boris is like one of the white knights, right? He's, he's the grail knight. So like, again, if you need a, a, any kind of, a, you know, both your sworn word and your admiration for Sir Boris should tell you that like you should fight on Sir Boris's side. 
don't be proud. Don't be trying to make your reputation by fighting against all of your friends, right? Like you used to do, Sir Lancelot. Um, did you learn nothing from that whole white knight and black knight scenario? Right? Didn't you get the point there at all, Lancelot? Oh, not well done. So, time for the disguise. So he's staying at um, Barnard, Sir Barnard, the uh, old baron there. So this old baron had a doctor that was called that time the Fire Maiden of Astolot, and ever she beheld Sir Launcelot wonderfully. And as the book saith, she cast such a love unto Sir Launcelot that she could never withdraw her love, wherefore she died, and her nam was Elaine Leblanc. Of course it is. So thus she come to and fro, and she was so hot in love that she besocked Sir Launcelot to wear upon him at the justice a token of hers. Damazel, sighed Sir Launcelot, and if I grant you that, and if I grant you that, ye may sigh that I do more for your love than ever I did for lady or gentlewoman. Then he remembered himself that he would go to the justice, disguise it, and because he had never afore borne no manner of token of no damsel, he bethought him to bear a token of hers, that none of his blood thereby might know him. And then he sighed, Fire maiden, I will grant you to wear a token of yours upon mine helmet, and therefore what is it? Show it me. Sir, she sighed, it is a red sleeve of mine, of scarlet, well, em well embroidered, with great perilous, great pearls. And so she brocked it him. So Sir Launcelot received it and sighed, Never did I erst so much for no damsel. He has this brilliant idea, right? Wait a second, I want to go in disguise. How can I go most deeply in disguise, right? How can I go deeper undercover than I've ever been before? By wearing a damsel's token, because I've never worn a damsel's token in my entire life, right? So nobody will suspect that it's me. And this works, right? This works because everyone who sees him the next day, right? They're like, wow, that guy's amazing. He's like as good as Sir Lancelot. I would say, Gawain even says, I would, I would, I would say it was, Sir, it looks like Sir Lancelot by his riding, except he's got a sleeve on his head, right? And everyone knows Sir Lancelot would never wear a damsel's sleeve on his head. So... Obviously, it's not him, but if it weren't for that, I would totally peg that guy for Lancelot, right? Ooh. Yeah, Devorah, Guinevere is going to love this. Guinevere's jealous reaction to this, of course, is much more justified. If his fighting for other damsels kind of looked bad from her point of view, how does this look? Nancy says if he plans to reveal himself later, what does he think is going to happen with the red sleeve? And Carita, your reaction is the one that I, uh, uh, the reaction that I share most. Carita says, poor girl. Yeah. Look what he says to her. If I ground you that, Ye may say that I do more for your love than ever I did for laddie or gentlewoman. All right. Uh, never did I erst so much for no damsel. Okay. Okay. Um, Lancelot is not doing right by this girl. He's using her. He's using her. 
as a disguise. Now, on the one hand, this is the thing. Um, any Dante fans out there? Um, Dante talks about this in the Vita Nuova. Um, there's this other lady, so Dante loves Beatrice, and the Vita Nuova is where he talks about his love for Beatrice. And there's this other lady that Dante refers to as his shield. That is, when people are beginning to talk and suspect that he loves Beatrice, he's got to conceal it because it's important. It must be kept secret. So he tries to conceal it. And the method that he uses to conceal it is that he uses this other woman as his shield. That is, he allows many people publicly to suspect that he loves this other woman so that they won't suspect whom he really is in love with. Right? Um, that kind of carrying on is not unknown in courtly love, right? Red flag right there, right? That should be a warning all by itself. If he's playing that kind of game, if he's using her in that kind of way, he is absolutely failing to break out of that whole system, right? Um, the best possible interpretation of this is that he is playing courtly love games and involving her against her will, right? Um, not that that's much of a defense other than to say that, like, it's a thing that people do sometimes, right? Um, yeah, Karina says this is the sort of bad behavior I'd expect from Tristram. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I don't know, Karita. I, I could imagine Tristram indulging in a different sort of bad behavior under some of the circumstances through this section. But, um, uh, but I hear you. I hear you. Um, he seems oblivious, completely oblivious to what, to the impact that he is having on her, right? To what his... What he is, he is declaring himself to her. I mean, he comes very close to making her a promise of his love here. To accept her token is a, a promise. It's a big, big deal. And he makes a big deal of it. And yet seems to miss the fact that it's a big deal. It's... It's a bad look. And s <clears throat> now he's at the tournament with Lavaine, which is Elaine's brother, right? Uh, and so they come hurling to getters and smote down many Knechtes of North Wallis and of Northumberland. And Juan Sir Launcelot saw them far so, that is, right, the group of Arthur's knights. He got a great spear in his hand, and there encountered with him all at Onis, Sir Bors, Sir Ector, and Sir Lionel, his brother and his two cousins. And they three smote him at Onus with their spears, and with force of themselves they smote Sir Launcelot's horse reversed to the earth. And by misfortune, Sir Bors smote Sir Launcelot through the shield into the side, and the spear brack, and the head left still in the side. Juan Sir Levine saw his master lie on the ground, he ran to the king of Scotties and smote him to the earth, and by great force he took his horse and brought him to Sir Launcelot, and magra them all he mad him to mount upon that horse. And Thon Sir Launcelot got a spear in his hand, and there he smote Sir Bors, horse and man, to the earth. And in the psalm wise he served Sir Ector and Sir Lionel, and Sir Levine smote down Sir Blamor de Ganis. And then Sir Launcelot drew his sword, for he felt himself so sore hurt that he went there to have his death. And then he smote Sir Bleoberus such a buffet on the helmet that he fell down to the earth in a soon. And at the same, in the same wise he served Sir Aliduke and Sir Galihod. And Sir Levine smote down Sir Sir Bellinger, that was son to Alexander le Orphelin. 
and by this was done was Sir Boris horsed again and in come with Sir Ector and Sir Lionel and all they three smote with their swearages upon Sir Laun- Launcelot's helmet and one he felt their buffetes and with that his wound grieved him grievously than he thought to do what he meeked while he could endure and then he gaff Sir Boris such a buffet that he mad him both his head passing low and wan he saw his visage so he pulled him down and in the same wise he served Sir Ector and Sir Lionel for as the book saith he meeked have slain them but when he saw their visages his heart meeked not serve him thereto but left him there. <laughs> Nancy says this always happens and they never stop. So Nancy you're right let us not let us not um, underplay the fact, right, that he does not in fact kill them. That's a win, right, compared to what we've seen in the past. He recognizes them, he rips their helmets off, and he refrains from killing them. So, you know, this is a good day in terms of uh, nightly combats that we've seen in the past. But boy, is that a small victory, right? We saw Lancelot and Bors swear always to be on the same side. And here they are fighting each other. And because they're fighting each other, because Lancelot chose the wrong side again, Sir Bors almost kills him by unhap, right? And then... Sir Lancelot, feeling himself wounded, right? Angry about his wound, about the pain that he is in. Angry at being, his horse being knocked down, right? By the three of them. Actually, yes, he doesn't kill them. That's good. But notice where he knows who they are. And he throws them down and rips off their helmets and almost kills them, right? Knowing who they were. Lancelot's on the wrong side. This should not be happening. And he would not be almost dying if it weren't happening. And to me, the sort of most alarming thing, he thinks he's going to die. Right? He feels himself near to... He went there to have had his death. He believes that the wound in his side is mortal. And how does he respond? Right? Lancelot, you're about to die. You are in the middle of bleeding to death. What are you going to do with your last minutes on earth, Lancelot? Answer... Fight and possibly kill my kinspeople, whom I know to be my kinspeople, right? Who love me and whom I love. Confusion, right? Lancelot is not in a happy place. He is in a place of unhap, right? And remember, this is what he himself predicted in that speech so long ago in the book of Sir Lancelot, right? When you love Paramours... What ends up happening? You end up killing people that you love, right, by unhap. That's what happens. That's what almost happened to him in two ways, right? He almost killed people by unhap. He almost was killed by unhap. Lancelot is not in a great place here. This is one of my favorite passages from this whole section. Um, I love Sir Barnard. Sir Barnard is the best dad of any dad we have seen in this whole book. Now, that's not a high bar. We've not seen very many good fathers, right? But Sir Barnard is a good father. Sir Gawain comes to stay with him, right? And tells him that uh, the knight with the red sleeve on his head did awesomely. Right. Was the by far the best night in the whole tournament. 
Now blessed be God, said this fire maiden of Astolat, that this that, that knick sped so well, for he is the man in the world that I first loved, and truly he shall be the last that ever I shall love. Now, fire maiden, sighed Sir Gawain, is that good knicked your love? Certainly, sir, she sighed, he is my love. Nay, truly, sir, sighed the damsel. I, sorry, I think we skipped a line there. She, he asks, Gawain asks her his name, right? And she says, Nay, truly, sir, sighed the damsel. I knew not his name, nother from whence he come, but to say that I love him, I promise God and you I love him. How had ye knowledge of him first, sighed Sir Gawain. If you don't know his name, how did you two meet, right? <laughs> Tell me the story about how you two anonymous lovebirds met. Then she told him, as ye have heard before, how her father betook him her brother to do him service, and how her father lent him her brother's Sir Tyrese's shield. And here with me he left his own shield. For what cows did he so? sighed Sir Gawain. For this cow, sighed the damsel, for his shield was full well canoeing among many noble knictis. Ah, fair damsel, sighed Sir Gawain, please, you, please hit you to let me have a seat of that shield. Sir, she sighed, it is in my chamber, covered with a cast, and if ye will come with me, ye shall see it. Not so, said Sir Barnard to his doctor, but send ye for that shield. I absolutely love that line. So understated. Right, Mallory was never this understated before. Right, here's wide-eyed Elaine saying, Oh yes, Sir Gawain, come to my bedroom and I'll show you. And her dad is like, actually, no. Why don't you send for... I am not letting Sir Gawain go with you to your bedroom, right? Sir Barnard is way wiser than that, right? Sir Barnard may be the smartest guy that we've met here. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, uh, notice the terms in which Elaine is speaking here. Gawain has every reason to believe that her statements reflect a mutual love. Is that good, Knecht, your love? Certainly, sir. He is my love, by which she means I love him, right? But she has reason to say he is my love. He accepted her sleeve. Yeah. Um, and Gawain is trying to figure out what's going on here, right? Right? Gawain comes to Arthur and says, Dude, it was Lancelot. All that canoe eye aforehand, sighed King Arthur. Remember, he saw Lancelot uh, from a distance, right? So he knew all along that it was him. And that cowsed me, I would not suffer you to have ado at the great justice, for I espied him when he came until his lodging, full lat in the evening, into Astolat. But great marvel have I, said King Arthur, that ever he would bear any sign of any damsel. For ar now I never heard say, nor knew that ever he bar any token of none earthly woman. When he says, any token of none earthly woman, what is he alluding to? Who is implicitly accepted from that? Whose tokens might Lancelot have perfectly well borne and nobody have been at all concerned? Exactly, yes. The Virgin Marys. Yes, exactly. Um, that That's okay. That would be, Remember Sir Gawain and Sir Gowan and the Green Knight has the Virgin Mary inside his shield, right? Totally legit, right? No, no problems with that. But an earthly woman? Okay, right? Okay. Be my head, sir, said Sir Gawain. The fire maiden of Astolat loveth him marvelously well. What hit meaneth I cannot say, and she is riding after to seek him. 
So the king and all come to London, and there Gawain all openly disclosed it to all the court that it was Sir Launcelot that justed best, and Juan Sir Bors heard that, wit you well, he was an heavy man, and so were all his kinsmen. But Juan the queen wist that it was Sir Launcelot that bare the red sleeve of the fair maiden of Astolat, she was nigh out of her mind of wrath. And Juan she sent for Sir Bors de Ganis in all hast that meeked be, so one Sir Bors was come before the queen, she sighed, Ah, Sir Bors, have ye not heard say how falsely Sir Launcelot hath betrayed me? Alas, madam, sighed Sir Bors, I am afeard he hath betrayed himself and us all. No force, said the queen, though he be destroyed, for he is a false traitor kneeked. I am afeard he hath betrayed himself and us all. Yeah. Um, yeah, Karita, I think you're exactly right. Karita's p imagining this girl with like big eyes and freckles and a diary with her name and his written inside a heart in glitter pen. Yeah, yeah, no, she, sweet and innocent is exactly what she is. That, I think, is the point of the joke about Sir Gawain in the bedroom, right? Is to show how innocent she is. Um, she invites Sir Gawain into her bedroom without a second thought, right? Because she doesn't think anything. I mean, she's, like, so innocent, right? That it doesn't ever occur to her. It occurs to her dad, right? I am not. So Sir Gawain is never going to see the inside of your bedroom, young lady, right? Um, but, um, but, and she will never wash that sleeve again, right? Yes, I'm going to keep that red sleeve spattered with the blood of his enemies, right? Up on my wall or maybe, uh, underneath my pillow or whatever. Yes, exactly. Um, She's adorable in every way. Um, Guinevere's wrath here, as I say, is to me much more sympathetic than her wrath before, right? Um, this looks really bad. And Bors, when Bors says... Um, I am afeard he hath betrayed himself and us all. It seems pretty clear. He doesn't, I think, really believe that Lancelot loves Elaine. Elaine II, right? Elaine II. Um, who's also I Elaine LeBlanc, you'll notice. Like, it's the thing about the duplicate name with the connected to whiteness. Anyway... Just like his old LeBlanc man's. Anyhow, um, so he's not thinking of, of Elaine, of the fair maid of Astolat here. He's thinking of Lancelot choosing the wrong side. Why did you fight against me, Lancelot? There was no cause. There was no reason, right? We swore we would always fight together, and now you disguise yourself it, 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 in this way that even I didn't suspect that it was you, and now I've almost killed you? Lancelot, the heck. When Bors finally meets Sir Lancelot. Ah, my lord, Sir Lancelot, God you bliss and send you hasty recovering, for full heavy am I of my misfortune and of mine unhappiness. For now I may call myself unhappy, and I dread me that God is greatly displeased with me, that he will suffer me to have such a sham for to hurt you that are our leader and all our worship, and therefore I call myself unhappy. Alas, that ever such a caitiff kneeked as I am shall have power by unhappiness to hurt the most noblest kneeked of the world. Where I so shamefully set upon you and overcharged you, and where ye meek have slain me, ye savoured me, and so dead not I, for I and all our blood dade to you their utterance. I am vile, said Sir Bors, that my hurt or my blood would serve me. Wherefore, my lord Sir Launcelot, 
I ask you mercy. Fire cousin, sighed Sir Launcelot, ye be wreaked welcome, and wit you well, over much ye say for the pleasure of me, which pleaseth me nothing, for why I have the same is sucked, for I walled with pride have overcome you all. And there in my pride I was near slain, and that was in mine own defocked, for I meeked have given you warning of my being there, and then had I had no hurt. For it is an old said sow, there is hard battile, there as kin and friend is, doth battile a, either against other. For there may be no mercy, but mortal war. Therefore, fire cousin, said Sir Launcelot, let this language overpass, and all shall be welcome that God sendeth, and let us lave of this matter, and spake of some rejoicing, for this that is done may not be undone, and let us find a remedy, how soon that I may be whole. Now this guy, so Lancelot is now being tended by Sir Baldwin of Britain, right, who was also one of Arthur's knights way back, not quite so far back as Sir Brastius, but, uh, but pretty far back. Um, Lancelot screwed up more than once here, like in more than one way here. Bors is upset about it and calls himself unhappy, right? He did wrong, or else he would never have been in this situation, he says. Lancelot, um, Lancelot blames himself, and notice the difference. He has something to confess, right? The root of the problem, he says, is his own pride. Now, here's the thing. Um, I agree, Carita. Yeah, he's right. Lancelot's completely right. That was his problem in the Grail Quest. He was still thinking in terms of his own pride, of establishing his own worship and reputation and his uh, proving his own chivalry, right, instead of doing what was right. Right, joining the right side, the correct side, the 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 white side against the black side, rather than just trying to increase his own reputation. Right, pride was his problem, and he recognizes that. So, Lancelot has messed up, but he seems not only to know that he messed up, but to. understand why. He diagnoses it correctly. It was his own pride that led him to this. It was his own pride that led him to accept the sleeve because he really wanted the disguise. Right? Notice the other irony here. He was fighting for damsels at the beginning in order to make people less suspicious of him and the queen. Right? Um... Well, wearing the sleeve of another woman is totally going to throw people off that particular scent, right? That would have been a great disguise. That is a great disguise for his love for Guinevere. But that's not why he did it, right? Um, he did it just to disguise himself. He did it just so that he could ensure that nobody on King Arthur's side would know that it was him so that he could establish himself more, right, for the sake of his own pride. So let's, um, you know, this ought to be a happy occasion, says Sir Lancelot. Um, let's talk about happy things. Um, let's stop there. We're not bad. We got through most of, uh, most of the stuff today. We still have to, uh, uh, finish the Fair Maid of Astolot's story, um, but uh, rather than rushing through that, uh, I don't think uh, Anne Shirley would approve if I rushed through the end of the story of the Fairy Maid of Astolat. So we'll start with that next time. Uh, we'll look at the end part of, uh, uh, of Elaine's story and move on through the beginning of the real crisis, right? The reconciliation of Lancelot and Guinevere. 
and when things get serious there. Um, read through the end of the book of Sir Lancelot and Queen Guinevere uh, for next time. We're going to get, I hope, most of the way through uh, next time. So, um, thanks everybody for joining me tonight. I will see you guys next week. I'll be here uh, again next week. I don't think I'm missing a Wednesday until the end of April. So, uh, we should have still several more, several more Wednesdays in a row here. Thanks everybody for joining me. Good night. And I'll see you guys next week. Bye now. The Mythgard Academy has been offering in-depth discussions of awesome books and films since 2013, completely free to attend and free to download. If you've enjoyed our discussions and would like to help them continue, please consider donating at signumuniversity.org fund.